You know, Jason Barrett, Senator Barrett, uh, joins us via telephone. JB, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. Good morning. You were busting my chops last appearance about Maryland drivers always in the left lane in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, my and I've had this observation. I've shared it before. I'll share it again. In West Virginia, there are two speeds people drive: way under the speed limit and insanely over the speed limit. There, there is no in between. <laughs> like if I'm but going, at least we do it in the, but we at least do it in the correct lane. <laughs> No, no way, dude! You, you, you've been on eighty-one, <laughs> eighty-one, and I and I, you know, I understand it on on eighty-one in the left lane because one, trucks can't be in there, but uh, two, it's the only lane where you're not taking body blows the entire time you're driving on it because the left lane is the smoothest lane since there's no trucks. It's not as beaten up. But otherwise, you're just like it's like taking body shots in the rib cage all the way down. Uh, Jason, you are in Huntington this morning, correct? I am, yeah. I've been yeah. here since uh, uh, Sunday, I think. Sunday morning. Inter early. For the interim sessions and uh, during your, your regular 60-day session, you're the vice chair of government org. But your uh, interim committees, you're the chair of regional jail and uh, correction facility authority. And it is on this topic I wish to begin today, sir. Are you okay with that? Okay. Sure. And, and we have a meeting uh, in that committee at 1030 this morning. So I think it's completely appropriate to start there. An article on Metro News by Brad McElhaney that appeared uh, yesterday in the afternoon said that the jail crisis, the staffing crisis, has uh, even gotten worse. Now 1,040 40 vacancies across the system statewide. 76% of Potomac Highlands Regional Jail in Augusta. 56% at the Northern Regional Jail in Moundsville. Martinsburg comes in third, 54% at the Eastern Regional Jail and 54% at the Vicki Douglas Juvenile Center in Martinsburg in terms of vacancies. Statewide, I think it's at 30% 30, uh, 30 uh, overall, 30 to 33%, 30%, uh, I think, with uh, everybody included, 33% with corrections officers. Man, what can we do about this is, is question number one. And question number two, what are you folks working towards in that end? Well, I, th there's no easy answer, I don't believe. I think that, you know, there are some things that, that uh, and ideas that we're kicking around. I think, you know, I think it starts with um, increased salary uh, for correction workers. Um, th there have been some uh, pay bumps in the, in the past few years. Uh, but you see uh, in the private sector, uh, wages uh, go up uh, tremendously here in the past couple of years. And we see that uh, in our personal income tax collections um, that you know the amount of, of of jobs and the amount of people working is going up, but but not going up uh, at the rate that our personal income tax collection is going up. So that's an indication that the wages are going up, and and wages and corrections and and uh, really just hasn't followed that. And it's a it's a very difficult job. It's it's stressful uh, both from a physical standpoint um, and from a mental standpoint. Um, so we have to start with pay raises, uh, but um, you know it's it's much more than that. I mean, it's 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 very difficult, and you know there the government is involved in a lot of things, and um, you know a lot of times the private sector think does things better than the government does. So um, maybe that's some type of long term solution. But um, you know we're we're I have another meeting uh, prior to that ten thirty meeting that is you know kind of an unofficial meeting where some of us are going to get together and. And talk about some of these uh, issues and corrections and and how we work, uh, you know, to to fix the problem. And those numbers that you that you rattled off there from Brad's article are staggering. The the amount of, of vacancies that we have, and uh, you know, we talk all the time about the National Guard there uh, that are, that are working in the prisons. Now they don't have direct contact um, with inmates. Um, in, in some cases, uh, DNR officers are working. Um, in the in the jails and prisons as well and um you know it's it's a real problem but it's not a problem uh just in west virginia there is a uh, a shortage of correction workers all over the country so it's not a problem unique to west virginia uh, but we we are working diligently to, to come up with some solutions there there isn't one uh there isn't one simple solution if there if there were we'd have already done that but uh it's it's multiple you know there are multiple things that we need to do and we're, we're working towards doing that what was the vacancy rate before the pandemic, Jason? Any idea? I, I don't. Um, I, I would say if I had to take a guess um, and using my best recollection, for less than half of what it is right now. John Gilstrap. 
what are the other issues that <clears throat> that are involved? I mean, if if we correct the the pay, you say that that's that's just one of of a number of issues in, in being a, a guard. I, I'm going to guess or a corrections worker. If that's the if that's the path one chooses, one sort of accepts that it, that there are dangers and such that come with it. It's like somebody becomes a firefighter or, or a police officer. So, are there other structural issues w- within the system that are preventing us from uh, filling these positions, or is it really pretty much pay? Well, I think pay is a is a big portion of that, and and you know, folks are willing to to take a little more risk and and. and do a difficult job if they're compensated appropriately. I mean, I think that's why you see, um, you know, uh, coal miners that, that mine they, they mine coal for a reason because they make eighty or ninety thousand dollars a year. Uh, so I, I think that's you know I think that's an example of um, you know people willing to take a risky job if, if the compensation uh, is appropriate. Uh, you know, I think that you know again it, it is a emotionally stressful, mentally stressful, physically stressful. The job and you know maybe the state needs to look at um, you know different th- packages um, maybe not necessarily salary but things that, that help uh, employees um, cope with a, a very stressful job um, maybe we look at um, you know some of the retirement um, uh, package for for correction workers and um, you know my I, I say this with not 100 percent certainty, but but pretty close that they're all in the PERS system, which is um, the public employee retirement system. That is that is the one that that basically all state employees are with. You know, there are some exceptions. There are different retirement plans for uh, for that, that are a little better for for some other employees. And um, you know, maybe this is one that we look at. Um, you know, giving them a little bit of a uh, a better retirement plan and maybe an earlier retirement. Uh, and that type of thing. So I, I think that that you know it comes down to some type of benefits package, um, you know, but also maybe something that that helps them cope with a very stressful job. Those are all very slow motion solutions. This is like if we could wave, wave a magic wand and and if, we're talking years, right, to, just to correct where we are now in order to get the the system up and running. Well, I don't. I, don't, I mean, I think it's. I mean, you look at our. Um, if you look at our budget numbers and, and where we are with the surplus, um, you know I think a, a, an increase in salary is not a huge lift right now. It, it is a, it is a, um, it is base building on our budget, so it's something that you have to be mindful of as you move forward. That we're not going to have record surpluses forever. Um, you know I don't think it's difficult to to go in and, and, and look at different retirement plans where we've, you know we we've moved other employees into to other retirement plans. Uh, very easily in the past, and you know, I was able to do that for Berkeley County uh, firefighters uh, to allow them to go into EMS retirement. So that's not something that's that's overly difficult. There are there are certainly other in, uh, uh, retirement plans out there that that we could move employees over to, and you know, there's a certain cost with that, and we'd have to you know see what if the numbers work. But I, I don't see those as. I mean, I think those those would help long term. I don't know that it's a long-term uh, implementation of either of those two ideas. Are those unfilled positions part of the budget surplus, or are they accounted for as appropriated money and therefore not part of the surplus? Well, we're using money to pay for, you know, some of the DNR officers. We're, we're, we're using money to pay overtime to a lot of our correction workers that that, that are still with us and, and still working there every day. They're, they're working a lot of overtime. So, that, that money is being spent. I mean, there, I, I don't. And then, obviously, uh, you know, with some of the other folks that we have working in our prisons that aren't typically doing that, um, you know, that's there's an associated cost of that. So, um, I don't think that you know we're talking about a 1.6 billion dollar surplus. Uh, we didn't get that by not having enough correction workers. That's just not that's not the, the, the basis for our record surplus. Matt Miller. Jason, has there been a survey or do you hear from either those that have left the corrections field and or are currently in the field to to kind of get more of an idea of just beyond salary, what are major issues that, that they're facing and that might lead them to leave if they haven't already? That, that's a good question. And I've, I've toured a couple of our facilities um, uh, in, in other parts of the state, is, and, and I toured ERJ several years ago, and, and some of the things that we talked about with employees, and you know, it really comes down to a you know, stressful job, money, 
Um, I, I don't know that, you know, I think that there's, there's certainly support, um, you know, from uh, folks that are, that are at corrections. I don't, I don't think it's that. I, I don't know that there are exit interviews, um, uh, you know, when, when someone gets another job or where do they lose those folks to. I, I can tell you that I believe that they lose them to law enforcement frequently. Um, and, and a lot of our uh, uh, law enforcement agencies uh, are, are now have bumped their pay up. Uh, which again is a very uh, risky and stressful job as well. But but it makes sense that someone that's a correction worker may also have interests in, in law enforcement. So you know I don't think there's a this big systemic problem within our corrections as to why we're losing them. I think it's you know I, I think it's more of compensation for employees and benefits and and other opportunities out in the private sector uh, that are less risky and and uh are are compensated better i don't i don't think it's much more complicated than that and again this is not a problem unique to west virginia it's a problem that a lot of states are facing are there specific requirements just like say a law enforcement officer that there are some physical demands that are going to be there there's a a mental capacity a, a thinking process maybe that needs to be there so is there testing and and requirements to be a corrections officer does that kind of narrow the pool down as well well, I, I certainly, you know, there's obviously physical demand. Uh, I, I don't know that, that you have to go through any type of physical training uh, to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm unaware if there is. I'm, uh, I don't believe that there is, but I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say that matter-of-factly. But um, and, and as far as a test, I, I don't know that there's any type of written test or, or anything like that. I think it is more about, you know, getting, getting people in there that are physically able to do the job, mentally able to do the job. And, and, and just like any other position that they would take, there's there's adequate and appropriate training uh, to do that job. And is that training typically done right there at the site, or is there like a police My academy? Okay, so it's not I, like no, they I, go I to any training. I believe it to be done right at the facility, okay. which the employees hired. Is there a vast disparity between the starting pay for a corrections worker and, say, starting pay for a state trooper? Yes. Um, I, I believe the number for uh, correction officer one, uh, which would be uh, obviously the, the, the entry level correction officer, I believe that number to only be fifteen dollars and seventy five cents. Yeah, uh, Jason. The according to the article by Brad McElhenney, starting uh, pay is thirty three thousand a year for an okay. officer. Uh, one well, fifteen seventy five at forty to forty yep. hours is it equates six hundred bucks. So that's in the right, it's in the ballpark. Yeah, no, it equates. Uh, correctional counselor might make twenty six thousand a year. Office assistants started even less than that. It, it seems like uh, we're getting what we deserve with those starting pay levels there, Jason. Yeah, yeah, it is it is viewed as. An entry level position. I, I believe this is my opinion. I think that, that for folks that, that are uh, that want to get in the type of correction officer line of work, uh, law enforcement line of work, that, that type of thing, that this is somewhat of an entry level position to them to get um, you know some experience under their belt and then move on to um, you know to, to something that has better compensation. I don't blame anybody for for doing that. Um, I think it's. I think the state has to, to really step up. And um, you know, when we you drive by convenience stores every day that advertise more than what we're paying a starting correction officer, uh, I think that's a big problem. And I think that's the the main reason why we struggle to um, attract and retain employees. How steep or how quickly, as well, does a pay increase come? So for that one that steps in and says, "Look, I can make twenty six thousand for a year or two, but after say year two, am I going to bump up and make significantly more?" It's. I think it would depend on what um, what position that you're moving to. I don't think that there are, uh, you know, if you're correction officer one or, or any of the other positions that. Rob mentioned, if you stay in that position for two to three, four years, I, I would not expect a, a significant bump mm-hmm. until you, um, you know, until there's some type of pay raise or until, um, you know, a different, uh, you know, you apply and, and receive a different position. So we're not only I mean, talking a starting wage, but to stay in that position that you've got to go up all the way across the board. Yeah. And, and you know, there are correction officer too, and I don't know, um, you know, the, the process by which you, you, get elevated from a correction officer one to two. Uh, I don't 
I, I don't know what that process is or, or, or what that's like for an employee to, to get that increase and, and to move up. Jason has a 930 meeting he needs to get to, so I know you've got to leave us in a, in a minute here, okay. Jason. But uh, before you do, I know you folks considered pay raise bills during the regular 60-day session. What was the reason why those bills were not completed and signed into law? Or reasons. Well, I, I think that you know that the, it, it's very clear that the tax cut dominated the session. Uh, there were there were a lot of other things. Uh, I think that the pay raise that the House of Delegates passed out um, again. It's been a few months ago, so I, you'll have to bear with my memory. But uh, it was extremely significant. I, I'm not sure uh, it was something that you know certainly something we'd like to do, but but it may have been a, a little too aggressive. Uh, for doing a the largest tax cut in the state's history, um, and um, you know, trying to do that at the same time uh, as well as some of the other things, uh, I, I'm completely supportive of a pay raise for correction uh, workers. We need to figure out what that appropriate raise is, uh, so that we, you know, here's the deal: if we don't raise it enough. Um, then we're going to end up with the same problem. And we're just going to spend a little bit more money to not solve the problem. So it has to be meaningful uh, where people want to do the job for that wage uh, to, so that we can continue to attract or start to attract, uh, attract and retain. But it has to be significant enough to help fix the problem. Is that a key uh, so element to, of this interim session to try to determine that number? Um I don't know. That's not what's on our agenda today. Now, I do have a meeting at uh, 930 where we're going to talk about uh, some other things. But the meeting at 1030, which is the committee meeting, um, is dealing with some things local here to Huntington. Uh, and I think part of our, our, our uh, what we need to look at is um, maybe we shouldn't be throwing everybody in jail all the time. Um, you know, there there are and, and John Shaw, who's the former uh, chair of judiciary, used to say, you know, we need to lock the people up where. Uh, scared of, not mad at. And so, you know, I, I think that we need to uh, to look at doing some of those type of reforms so that we don't have um, so many folks um, in our jails and prisons. And, you know, certainly uh, Berkeley and Jefferson County have done uh, an excellent job with uh, drug court, with day report center, uh, recovery resource, home confinement. And that's really what we're going to hear from some folks in Huntington and Cabell County uh, today. Uh, prosecuting attorney uh, in Cabell County, uh, as well as uh, uh, the Sixth Circuit uh, Court judge uh, here in Cabell County to talk about some of those issues. And, and, and again, Berkeley and Jefferson are doing a good job. A lot of the state is not. Um, some some counties uh, don't have a day report center. I think there are six, and I think that's um, incredibly uh, foolish on their part, um, and it's very short-sighted. So I think there are other things that we can do to help uh, reduce, you know, our inmate population, uh, which would obviously help with uh, some of the jail costs and, and free up money uh, to, to pay people appropriately. Jason, thanks so much for your time this morning. Always a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Senator Jason Barrett at 928, and uh, he is in Huntington for the interim sessions that are going on as we speak. And uh, on the interim committee list of responsibilities, he is the chairman of the Regional Jail and Correctional Facility Authority.